Hi everyone, I'm Pam Fox at pamfox.org and I have a special uh, guest coming on live in just a moment. I'm going to go ahead and share this out to my page. Okay, hi Paul. Welcome. I hope you can stay around for the interview. Dr. Cliff Higgins on to the broadcast. And um, I want to be um, really transparent. There he is. Welcome. Hello. Well, um, first of all, <laughs> Um, do you prefer Dr. Higgins, Dr. Cliff? What shall I call you? Cliff. Cliff. Okay. I thought you'd say that. <laughs> you can call me Pam. Okay. <laughs> um, so a couple of things before we get started. One is I just want to make sure my viewers know that um, results do vary when it comes to reversing a hiatal hernia. So Dr. Cliff is going to share his story. You guys have heard my story if you follow me. But because hiatal hernias, everybody is different. Everybody's story um, varies. Um, everybody's treatment varies. Everybody's hernia um, varies. How long they've had it, their lifestyle, all of those things can contribute to um, the hernia itself and the condition. So that's number one. And then number two, um, Cliff is a dentist from Arkansas and he is not an expert on hiatal hernia. He's just here today to answer questions and, and share his story. So we'll do a Q&A at the end of the segment. So if you have your questions, you can type them below and I'll kind of be keeping my eye on those and then we'll take a couple of questions at the end. So again, thank you so much for being here. I know you've probably had a busy day seeing patients and I feel very, very honored that you agreed to come on and um, share your story with us today. Well, so welcome. Thank you for having me, Pam. It has been a busy day, and uh, but I'm, I'm glad to, to come on to this Facebook Live and and tell you the good news is that there's hope if you have a hiatal hernia. There's there's wonderful hope for the misery that, that you're going through, you can end it. Yes, there is, that's right. Um, so let's just hear a little bit about your history. Specifically, what were your symptoms? How long did you have them? That kind of thing. Okay, for the most part, um, all my life I'd been healthy. Um, I'm active in my church and I go on medical mission trips. And I think one of the big hindrances to diagnosing my problem was the fact that in uh, June of 2016, I went on a medical mission trip to Lima, Peru. And two weeks after I came home is when these symptoms started. And I don't know if something w went on on that trip that agitated this, but that's when it started. And all the physicians who have treated me always go back to that and, and, um, I can look back on it and see it caused a lot of problems because the physician who went on our trip back then in June of 2016 is a good friend of mine, went to church with us at the time. And what he told me was, he said, Cliff, you probably contracted some kind of bacteria, a parasite, a virus, something. And so his exact words were, we have to sterilize your gut. And so he prescribed me a regimen of about five different antibiotics that I took for 10 days. And that in turn caused Clostridium difficile, C. diff. I was quarantined in the hospital in Memphis, Tennessee for eight days. So that's kind of how this all began. It was just, it was bad from the get-go. And uh, to make a long two-year story short, I've been treated in four different states by several different physicians, very good ones, mind you, uh, and never really got any straight answers as to what the problem was. My, my chief complaint was always chronic belching. I, I describe it as if it were not air, it would be vomit. And it happened continuously. I mean, all day. And my wife said in my sleep at night, I would burp. And it was just continuous. And so uh, I had this bloated feeling and I just was always full of air. And what I kept hearing from the physicians over and over was, you're uh, a habitual air swallower. That's what they would tell me. And I didn't feel like I had any kind of a habit where I, you know, swallowed air and caused myself to have to, you know, burp that air back out. It was something going on inside me. And I knew it was something inside that there just some, something was wrong. 
And um, one of the clinics that I went to was Barnes Jewish Hospital in St. Louis, Missouri, in November of last year, 2017. I went there. They did an esophageal mobility test and a mm -hmm. pH study, 24 hour pH study. Out of the two years that I had all these tests, and I've had every kind of test imaginable, I've had blood work, I've been scoped top to bottom, I've, I've had um, I've had all the sounds of my abdomen, CT scans, um, even had my gallbladder checked, a pivot test, and some of these tests done multiple times. The only finding that was ever abnormal was when Barnes Jewish Hospital did the swallow study. They found the lady doing the test said, "Are you aware that you have a hiatal hernia?" And I said, no, I'm not. She said, well, you have one. She said, it's a small sliding hiatal hernia. And she said, it probably doesn't have anything to do with your symptoms. And so their GI physician said the same thing when I went to see him after the test results came back. He said, well, we see you have this small hernia, but it probably doesn't have anything to do with your symptoms. So they told me I was habitually swallowing air, which kind of torqued me. And I couldn't get out of there fast enough because I thought these people don't know what they're talking about. So I came home and, and I, I went on for some time there trying to deal with that. And uh, they wanted me to see a clinical psychologist. And I told my wife, I said, I'm not crazy. I'm not swallowing air. I'm not doing this. I'm not causing this. So um, it got so bad that um, in July of this year, I went to uh, the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. The GI doctor that I was seeing in Little Rock, Arkansas is very good. She's very thorough, but she couldn't figure this out. And she said, all I know to do is send you to Mayo Clinic. So I went there, excellent doctors. The doctor I saw, I believe he's, he's a genius, but, um, and he tried to get to the bottom of this. I mean, I have a stack of medical records that look like a phone book and he went through everything and uh, he felt like that something probably insulted my system on this mission trip to Peru, which just got everything out of whack. I, I wasn't functioning normally. He said, something's causing you to have this abnormal function of your system where you feel like you need to constantly burp. And he said, we've seen people like this and we think we can help you. So I did see their clinical psychologist and she said, for your symptoms, what you can do and what has helped people with what you're going through is something called deep diaphragmatic breathing. And so when they told me this, I said, look, I'm game to try anything. You know, if, if, if that's what I need to do, I'll try it. So that was uh, at 8 o'clock one morning, I talked to this lady, and she told me how to do this. And, and as you've told in your videos, Pam, she, she told me a way to do it, but it's not, really, it's not really correct for someone who has a hiatal hernia. She said to, you know, relax, sit up straight, have good posture, breathe in, and feel my abdomen, just feel my abdomen go out. But she said, as you exhale, she said, I want you to try to squeeze all the air out of your abdomen, try to touch your navel to your spine, which, you know, I've learned from you that's incorrect. But she told me to do this. So I worked and worked and worked with it and struggled. And I was supposed to see the physician there, the GI doctor, at, at 1 o'clock that afternoon. So from 8 o'clock in the morning until about 1 o'clock, I was able to fend off this urge to belch by doing this diaphragmatic breathing technique. And when I told him that, this guy was Irish. He's, he, I love his accent. He's a great doctor. He said, well, there you have it, Cliff. You've got a tool. You've got a tool to attack the problem. So I thought, well, okay, I'll go home with this tool and I'll try to breathe and see if I can't overcome this. So I came home with this knowledge of, of diaphragmatic breathing, maybe keeping my abdomen moving. Hopefully that will correct the malfunction of my GI system. And I cannot tell you why, I have no idea why, within the two years that I went through all this, all the books we read, all the internet searches that my wife and I did, all the doctors that I saw and the tests I underwent, I never took my iPhone and did a YouTube search for chronic belching until three days after I returned home from Mayo Clinic. I laid down that night, and this was in July this year, I took my iPhone and I typed in on the YouTube app, I typed in chronic belching and it pulled up hundreds of videos. About the fifth title down caught my attention. It said chronic belching, how I overcame it and hiatal hernia. And that was your video. And I watched this thing about nine minutes and 20 seconds long. And I was flabbergasted because you were describing everything to the T that I had gone through. What you went through from the doctors telling you you were habitually swallowing air, 
the techniques. Then you go into this description of the the uh, treatment for this and how to start to correct it is through deep diaphragmatic breathing. And I had just come home from Mayo Clinic, and that's what they told me to do. But then you said, but you don't do it the way they tell you to do it in a clinical setting from a GI doctor's office or clinical psychologist or whoever. So when you told me that, it made perfect sense. And I thought, I know I know, I have had that diagnosis of hiatal hernia. So I got all my medical records out, and I was going through all that. And about halfway through, I found the test, the esophageal mobility test from Barnes Jewish Hospital. And the three findings at the bottom of that page, the very last thing listed is small sliding hiatal hernia. And so I thought, okay, this lady knows what she's talking about. I'm going to try to do what she's saying and see if I can't you know, hurry up and, and speed up the process of getting better. So I started watching all your YouTube videos. Everything made perfect sense. And when I, when I started doing these exercises you were talking about and I started looking into nutrition and things that I need to do to kind of help my body to overcome this, I started getting better really quick. And uh, I also went to your website and you have 10 exercises that you can purchase to do. And so I got those and, um, had I only known two years ago that I could have gone to your website and for less than $100 purchased your 10 exercises and, and fixed this, I could have saved thousands upon thousands of dollars in two years of misery. But I'm just glad I found you when I did. So that's basically my story. And, and what I've done by doing these 10 exercises that you have on your website, I can do any one of those 10 exercises if I feel, which in about three weeks now, I haven't even felt any symptoms. I mean, I've pretty well reversed this, but at, when I first started that, I was, I was, I would sometimes feel the urge, you know, like I was bloated and need to burp. And I would remember the number one thing you have to do is relax your abdominal cavity. I would be sitting chair side working on a patient, uh, kind of a high stress situation. Maybe I've got a five-year-old I'm doing a filling on and I got to hurry and I notice, man, I feel like I've got a burp and the, the first thing I, I notice is my abs are tightened up and I'm bent over and I'm in a knot and my nerves are racked, you know, and I'm thinking, relax. And then when I just breathe, relax my abs, sit up straight, it, the urge just goes away instantly. And, and I noticed that doing that, I could suppress the urge to have to burp. And so I haven't felt like I needed to burp like that in weeks now because I do these exercises. I still do them every day. I, first thing I do when I get up in the morning and then several times throughout the day even i'm just trying to strengthen my diaphragm so that you know this problem won't reoccur so that's basically my story and and you know to to hear it in a somewhat of a nutshell that's what happened with me oh thank you so much that's great and so my next question is then um a lot of my customers will say oh i love this exercise or oh no i love that exercise and some of them are more popular than others but do you have, if you have a favorite exercise um, of the 10 that I teach, go ahead and share it. One that you find is like your favorite or is that most effective in giving you instant relief. And I'll go ahead and demonstrate it for our viewers. Well, probably the, when I first started trying to overcome this, the, the rib roll where you just, you, you feel your sternum slide over a few inches and find that lower rib and roll your fingers kind of under that and hold it and rela totally relaxing your abs at the same time and volume is the key have enough room in your abdomen for your stomach to drop down it seemed like that would almost give me instant relief and i it got to where after i after i did these for a while you could even feel the hernia drop down below the diaphragm i mean i could tell you know when i instantly oh. got that that relief and it would the esophageal sphincter would close and the desire to burp would go away just instantaneously so that was the initial exercise that probably got me the most relief. What I think now I find, um, and I don't want to give them all away, but when I, when I make a heart, I mean, you can just, as you inhale, you go up and inhale, and you've got to totally relax your abs the whole time you do this. But as you, as you go up and mm -hmm. inhale and then exhale as you come down like this, I can do that. It seems like if I feel pressure in my abdomen like I need to burp, I can do that one time and it just goes away. But I, I generally, as I do it in the morning, mm -hmm. I do that. I repeat it about 10 reps, about 10 times. I do all of them about 10 times each first thing in the morning. And then throughout the day, I mean, I just do it to – I'm doing this to strengthen my diaphragm. I mean, as, as you've told, it's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's skeletal muscle tissue – 
And uh, what I'm trying to do is strengthen it up to where I wanted to be like you and not have to worry about going around holding my side because for the first two or three weeks that I was doing this, I noticed I was driving down the road. I was holding that rib, you know, or uh, in the office. I would, I would have my side. I was holding that just to try and push down on my stomach. And so, but I don't have to do that now. It's, it's my story mirrors yours so much. It's, it's uncanny because I've gotten to the point that I really don't even have to think about that too much anymore. It's just, uh, it, it's daylight and dark, really. The the way that I'm I'm living my life now, really, my my six kids and my wife they've they've gotten their dad and their husband back because I lived honestly in in total misery. I didn't feel like doing anything when I would go home from here. I mean, it was it was miserable working all day. Um, before I would go into patient treatment rooms to treat a patient, I was constantly burping off air to try and just get enough relief to go in and talk to a patient. I didn't know to do these things to relax my abs to overcome this, and I, I really, I really think that part of the problem is um, that vagus nerve. I mean, you know, everything that happens in Vegas doesn't stay in Vegas because <laughs> when that when that vagus nerve's affected, there's there are a myriad of things that can go on. And for me, I think what was happening is pressure on that vagus nerve was part of what was causing my my need to burp because when there's no pressure there then i'm normal so but th those are a couple of the ones i mean i like every one of those exercises they all work fine any one of the 10 i could do and get instant relief now like you say everyone's different i have a small sliding hiatal hernia that's what you had uh so mm -hmm. you know some hernias require surgery but uh for me this worked and i think it would work for a lot of people that's why i wanted to come on here so that people that have the same diagnosis that you and I have, there's an easy way to overcome this. Yeah. Okay, so really quick, I'll just, um, for the viewers, I'll just give them kind of a taste of those two exercises that you were talking about. The first one is called the rib roll. And basically, I'm going to stand up a little bit so people can see my ribs. But you come in on the left side and you find the lower rib of your rib cage. And you want to be over on the left. You don't want to be directly on the hernia. And you're just going to roll your fingers over the ribs. And what that does is just comes down and creates space between your ribs and your stomach. Because what can happen is your stomach gets either pushed up against your diaphragm, or in the case of the hiatal hernia, through the diaphragm. And so we're just coming in and, and creating a little bit of space that will push that stomach down. And so what I say in my course over and over again is just to be very gentle with these exercises. You don't want to get in and get super aggressive. You got to remember your stomach is there, your spleen is there, and if you have a, you know additional problems going on, you don't want to get in there and just really start irritating things. Everything is irritated already. You've got tender, irritated tissues there already at the herniated site. So this is something you just kind of want to be patient and consistent with, and do it like Cliff said on a regular basis, and you should start to see results. And like he said, um, small sliding, sliding hiatal hernia. Again, that's what I had as well. And so for me, it really just, it was just a matter of a couple of weeks to start to get instant relief. And then maybe another couple of months to really build up that diaphragm through um, the diaphragmatic exercises that he spoke of to really strengthen that hiatus so the stomach can't push through again. Um, the other exercise he mentioned where you raise your hands up, uh, it's called making a heart because you kind of draw a heart with your hands. When you lift your hands up, that motion lifts your rib cage up. And as you lift your rib cage up, it lifts your diaphragm up. So again, when your stomach is crammed up against the diaphragm, putting pressure on that lower esophageal sphincter, if we can lift that diaphragm up and then relax the abs, as you mentioned, so that the stomach has room to come down, then that's where we begin to create that little bit of space between the two, which is what we want because Essentially, the, the primary reason we have the symptoms we have with hiatal hernia and GERD um, is because of all of that pressure that's being put on the anatomy, whether it's, like you said, the vagus nerve, the lower esophageal sphincter, the stomach, the diaphragm, the heart, the aorta, the lungs. We can have a really a large variety of different symptoms depending on where the pressure is within you internally. So if we can unherniate that stomach and get it down to where it's meant to be, then you don't have those pressures on the anatomy and it can begin to heal. But as I said, results do vary, and this can take time. If you've got a large hiatal hernia where a lot of your stomach is up there, then you're going to have to be really patient and just practice these exercises every single day and really, really learn how to um, relax your abs, like you said, and breathe into the belly because that's going to start to get that help that movement along. 
Um, so thank you for sharing those favorites. I did have um, um, one other question. Um, I, I stress holistic healing a lot here, and, um, and all that means is, you know, we treat the whole body, and then we look at, you know, different avenues in terms of treatment. So for me, with reversing hiatal hernia, I teach, you know, healing the gut. I teach identifying what caused your hiatal hernia in the first place, because if you're trying to reverse and move your stomach down, but you've got that, that pressure that caused it in the first place still pushing you up, pushing it up, then it's going to be um, an uphill battle. Now with you, we're, we're not really sure what caused the hiatal hernia. Um, it could be something to do with your travels, like you say, with a, could be a bacteria or a parasite or something that caused, and then, you know, all those um, antibiotics uh, treatments that followed. I, I'm sure all of that had I something to do. I have a pretty good idea as to what the causative factor of it was. Um, I've been practicing dentistry for 24 years, and they told us in dental school, have good posture, set up straight. I wear surgical loops when I practice so that I will have good posture. There's a focal point that, you know, everything's in focus when I'm sitting up straight, but that can be overcome. You can, you can lean around the patient and lean over. And 24 years of doing dentistry, it's, it's, it's kind of a, a high intensity environment. And I'm certain that the uh, posture that I'm in and the stress that I'm under, and I've always been told, like I've heard you say, you know, um, stand up straight, have good posture, suck in your gut. I've done that all my life. And then working in this profession for 24 years, um, bending over patients, they told us in dental school, don't slouch, don't lean forward because it puts pressure on your internal organs and that can cause bad things to happen. Well, I think even though I tried my best over the last 24 years, probably I put enough pressure on my abdomen over that time frame to cause a small sliding hiatal hernia. So I believe that's probably something in Peru may have irritated this to the point that it kind of has shown up more, you know, than, than I noticed in the past. But I think that's what it is, my profession. Yeah, and that makes perfect sense. So um, Cliff is talking about poor posture as you as you hunch over. I was talking about the stomach and the diaphragm. As you hunch over, that diaphragm is going to come down and stomach is going to come up in that hunched over position. So, so, um, so yeah, good posture uh, versus poor posture are definitely contributor, contributors to the condition. Um, Janet asks, is six centimeters considered small or large? It's right in the middle, Janet. I would say it's closer to the large side, but I would, I would say medium, medium size. Uh, okay, so so anyway, getting back to holistic um, treatments, um, um, identifying identifying um, what what created your hiatal hernia in the first place and addressing that, along with healing your gut, and then learning these exercises in order to move the stomach down and then strengthening the diaphragm, like you mentioned. So, has there been anything else um, uh, that that you can um, suggest to the viewers that's kind of been a part of your holistic treatment? I know some people take supplements and do heel drops and different things like that. Is there anything else that you can recommend? Everyone is so different. You know, I've talked to a lot of patients about this, and I'm, I'm really surprised at how prevalent this problem is. Um, I had a lady in here, she was in my office about a week ago, and she said, as I was describing it, I could see she had this kind of funny smile on her face. I said, what? She said, I have one of those. She said, I have a hiatal hernia. And she said, you know, if I eat chocolate, it just completely irritates it beyond anything else. So things that, that we uh, take in our, into our diet, you know, that's, I think diet is, is, is part of it. Um, what I found, though, really... For me, the exercises help beyond anything else, just being able to, to understand that in my job environment, when I'm stressed, when I'm, my abs are tensed up, and I'm now just by having an increased volume in my abdomen, is that symptom so i think the more that you can learn about this and and, and what i think is physicians don't yes i mean i've been everywhere and and i think the treatment 
for any anomaly has to begin somewhere. And I really believe that the, the best treatment for small sliding hiatal hernia begins with you, Pam, because nobody else ever explained this to me this way. And I mean, even though several doctors who I would consider very intelligent saw the diagnosis right in front of their face of a small sliding hiatal hernia, they didn't pick up on that. So um, your methods and holistic approach to this, I think, you know, that I'm hoping, and I, I'll tell you, when I came back and found this out, every doctor that I had seen in every state that I've been to and every facility, I was emailing, if I had their phone numbers, I was texting, calling, I tried my best to get this information to them. And I can tell you that the Irish doctor at the Mayo Clinic, he was the one person who responded to me, and he said, he was glad that I saw this video and shared it with him, and he said it was very powerful. He was glad that 26,000 people had seen that video. So that's the type of person who can really help someone if they are open-minded and understand, you know, what's going on here and that, that you're, you're helping people. I want people to understand that there's a way to, to treat this, and it's very simple, and they need to be teaching this to medical school. <laughs> Yeah, um, it's interesting. I, I belong to a lot of support groups, and I hear time and time and time again um, kind of this uh, same thing, which is where people will go to their doctor and kind of a similar story to yours, but they'll, they'll say, oh, I saw this video where this woman says you can re reverse a hiatal hernia, and time and time again, they will say, my doctor says it's impossible. My doctor says it's impossible. So you're right. I think, uh, you know, among the doctors, there are different mindsets different beliefs and different abilities to be open to different ideas, which, you know, hopefully that's um, changing. I know I work with a naturopath and when I told her that I was able to reverse my own hiatal hernia, she was very excited about it and she actually refers her patients to me. So, so that's really cool. That's good. So, you know, there are doctors out there that are, that are open um, to this and, and there are, there, there are those that say strictly it's impossible. It cannot be done. So. Well, you get into, Doctors want to take out a pen and get the prescription pad and they want to write your prescriptions for proton pump inhibitors and things that I've researched this enough to know that the, the kind of approach that they take to this is, is making things worse than better. You know, I mean, uh, when they talk about um, trying to reduce your stomach acid, you don't need to reduce your stomach acid. You need to block your stomach acid from coming up. It needs to be there for you to be able to, to digest food properly. So um, I haven't taken any medications, antibiotics, uh, EPIs, anything like that in a long time. I, I've tried, one thing that I try to do is stay away from, I try to stay away from prescription medications. Or I, I will take a few supplements, um, things that uh, like potassium, things like that, that I feel like if, if I feel like my body needs, you know, but uh, prescription medications uh, and even in my own practice unless they're absolutely necessary and especially with what i went through with all those rounds of antibiotics and contracting c diff my, my perspective my, the way my view of seeing how to treat someone has really changed because of the way you know what i've gone through the, the situation with me so um some of this stuff their approach to it is just um I just wish they could. I wish they could see, and I always said the proof is in the pudding. If they could, if they could feel and know my results after two years of misery, to know how it feels to feel good now, and just by doing some, exercise, some simple exercises, you know, and not having to take prescription medications, that's that's the greatest thing you can ask for. Yeah, and you know, it's one of the reasons I really wanted to connect with you and have you on here is because. I, I felt such a connection with you immediately because as you say, you felt like the male version of me. And when you said the words, when you said the words, I just feel normal, that's, that's been my level of enthusiasm since the beginning. I'm just so thankful mm -hmm, to cool. feel normal. So I'm really happy that you're feeling normal as well and, and getting back on track Thank with, you. with everything. Great. <laughs> Well, I think that's about it. Um, we can go ahead and wrap this up. So I want to let my viewers know there's a couple of things that you can do. You can follow me here on Facebook. I try to come on once a week and share um, exercises, answer questions. Um, you can also scroll through some of my past archive videos and get more information that way. Um, 
but I do have all of these um, exercises conveniently located in one, one place for a purchase um, at my website, panfox.org. So you can check, the, check it out there as well. Um, Lane says, I wanna let you know you've given me some hope when everyone in my life didn't. I'm not really healed, but the hope is a start. Well, that's awesome, Lane. I appreciate you giving us that feedback. That's why we came on here today. Um, these kinds of stories really do give people hope because um, like Cliff just said, the proof is in the pudding. So if someone can come out and give a testimony and say, yeah, I was miserable. I had all those symptoms and my doctor told me I was crazy and my doctor told me I couldn't, you know, um, reverse this condition except for to maybe take a pill or have a surgery. And yet here are people that are, that are doing it. So I'm glad that gives you hope. And um, Lane, I would encourage you to continue to do, um, follow me and do and try these exercises. Paul says, Pam equals hope. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. <laughs> um, Janet says, is there hope for me with a six centimeter? Yeah, Janet, my personal belief, and, and I am not a doctor, but my personal belief is that most tidal hernias can be reversed. It's just going to take a lot longer when they're bigger and when they've been around for a long time. And if you follow me on Facebook, you'll um, a lot of the videos I've done in the past kind of explain why this is anatomically, why it takes longer. Um, and you could have other conditions that are contributing to that as well. So again, you really have to look at it holistically. There may be a number of things that you need to do um, therapy-wise to treat your hiatal hernia. Um, with Cliff, you know, he's, in, he's a, a young man, he's in, he's in good shape, and he was able to, he had a small hiatal hernia, so simply with a few simple exercises, he was able to reverse his, but that's not always going to be the case. So, all right. <laughs> but your phone or mine. Um, so one more question. Nicola asks, is surgery a dangerous option? Well, my, Nicola, my opinion on surgery, obviously there's always risks with surgery. When it comes to a hiatal hernia repair, they are oftentimes temporary. And in my opinion, the reason for this is because whatever caused your stomach to push up and herniate in the first place, if you don't address that and whatever is still pushing your stomach up and then you have the surgical repair, then you still have that pressure pushing your stomach up. And so whatever that pressure was, if it still remains, it can cause a re-herniation, which, which, is, this, this, which is what I hear from a lot of people. Again, I'm in a lot of different groups, and so um, um, I'm not saying that you shouldn't have a surgical repair, but yes, there are risks. There are risks with any surgery, and they are oftentimes temporary. So, you know, six months, a year, five years down the road, they start to have the same symptoms again. Um, so that's my take on that. Okay, so let's go ahead and wrap this up. Cliff, I went over and visited your Facebook page for your... Um, your dentist office, yeah. congratulations. You've got all five-star reviews over there, and it looks like you're a really popular guy over there, so keep up the good work. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on today. You're very welcome. Thank you so much. And keep in touch. Okay, I will. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end the broadcast. If anyone has further questions, you can post those in this uh, comment question below, and I will get to them later. Thanks again, Cliff. You're welcome. Take care.